Good evening, everyone. My name is Ana Otero. I am a law professor at Thurgood Marshall School of Law in Houston, and I'm currently the president of the board of the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you and to thank the sponsors of this panel, EPF Media, TCADP, and Witness to Innocence. Our panel discussion tonight is about the remarkable documentary about Cesar Fierro entitled Los Años de Fierro, The Years of Fierro. Hopefully, you have had an opportunity to watch this moving portrayal of Cesar's life. If not, it will be available to you until May 21st. This is a story of resilience, persistence, and ultimately hope. As you know, in 1979, Cesar was convicted of fatally shooting a cab driver, Nicolás Castañón, in El Paso. His conviction rested on his supposed confession and the testimony of Gerardo Ollague, who claimed to have been present during the crime. In 1996, the Texas Courts of Criminal Appeals reviewed a trial court's decision in Cesar's favor and affirmed the suppression of his confession holding that there was a strong likelihood that it had been coerced. However, the court held that the original failure to exclude the confession was a harmless error, finding that Oyage's testimony provided an independent basis supporting the conviction. Cesar served 40 years in prison until 2020 when he was paroled. Cesar has always maintained his innocence. Our panel tonight We'll discuss the legal trappings of the case and the reasons why it took 40 years for Cesar to gain his freedom. In 2005, I wrote a law review article about Cesar's case. And back then, I never imagined that I would be sitting on a panel with Cesar and with these wonderful folks who relentlessly fought for justice for him. So it gives me great privilege tonight to introduce our panelists. I begin with the start of the documentary, Cesar Fierro. Cesar survived 40 years of wrongful imprisonment on death row in Texas for a crime he did not commit. He is now a free man, starting a new life. Santiago Estenu, the director of the Years of Fierro. Sandra Babcock, one of the lawyers who helped uncover evidence that the police coerced Cesar's confession and served as counsel to the government of Mexico in the cases of Mexican nationals facing the death penalty in the United States and Dick Burr, who has devoted his practice entirely to death penalty defense work since 1979. He began representing Cesar in early 1995 and served as his legal counsel ever since. For the benefit of our non-English speaking participants, I will make this brief introduction in Spanish and will proceed to ask the questions to the panelists, first in Spanish and then in English, actually the other way around, first in English and then in Spanish, and the responses will also be translated simultaneously. Para beneficio de nuestros participantes que no, había, que no hablan inglés, haré esta breve introducción en español y procederé a hacer las preguntas a los panelistas primero en inglés y después en español. Las respuestas también serán traducidas simultáneamente. Buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Ana Otero, soy profesora de Derecho en la Facultad de Thurgood Marshall en Houston, y presidente de la Junta de la Coalición para Abolir la Pena de Muerte. Quiero extender las bienvenidas a todos ustedes y agradecer a nuestros patrocinadores, EPF Media, la Coalición de Texas para Abolir la Pena de Muerte y la Organización Testigo de la Inocencia. Nuestro panel de discusión de esta noche trata sobre los nota el notable documental sobre César Fierro, titulado Los Años de Fierro. Espero hayan tenido la oportunidad de ver este conmovedor retrato de la vida de César Esta es una historia de resiliencia, persistencia y al final de fe y esperanza. Como saben, en el 1979 César fue condenado por disparar fatalmente a un taxista Nicolás Castañón en El Paso. Su condena fue basada en su confesión y el testimonio de Gerardo Ollague, quien afirmó haber estado presente durante el crimen. En 1996, el Tribunal de Apelación de, de, los Estados, de Texas, perdón, Revisó la decisión de un tribunal de primera instancia a favor de César y afirmó la supresión de su confesión, sosteniendo que existía una gran probabilidad de que hubiera sido coaccionada. Sin embargo, la Corte sostuvo que la omisión original de excluir la confesión fue un error inofensivo al concluir que el testimonio de Ollague proporcionó una base independiente que respaldaba la condena. César cumplió 40 años en la cárcel hasta el 2020, cuando fue liberado. César siempre ha mantenido su inocencia. Nuestro panel de esta noche discutirá las trampas legales del caso y las razones por las cuales pasaron 40 años para que finalmente lograra su libertad. 
en el 2020 yo escribí un artículo sobre el caso de Fierro y cuando entonces nunca pensé, nunca me pude imaginar que hubiera estado moderando un panel con César presente y con aquellos que lucharon sin descanso por su libertad. Entonces es un gran privilegio presentar al panel César Fierro, la estrella del documental, sobrevivió 40 años de encarcelamiento injusto en el corredor de la muerte de Texas por un crimen que no cometió. Ahora es un hombre libre que comienza una vida nueva. Santiago Estenew, realizador de este magnífico documental Los Años de Fierro. Sandra Babcock, uno de los abogados que ayudó a descubrir pruebas de que la policía coaccionó la confesión de César y se desempeñó como abogado del gobierno de México en los casos de ciudadanos mexicanos que enfrentan la pena de muerte en los Estados Unidos. Y Dick Burke, quien ha dedicado su práctica por completo al trabajo de la defensa de la pena de muerte desde el 1979. Dick comenzó a representar a César a principios del 1995 y se desempeñó como su abogado principal desde entonces. I will ask the questions first in English and then in Spanish. César, um, I'm going to begin with you. You cannot see that, but I guarantee you that there's a whole audience eager to hear you and eager to hear from you. So how are you? And can you give us a sense of what this last year of freedom has been like for you? Cesar, ¿cómo estás? ¿Puedes darnos una idea de cómo, cómo te sientes y cómo te has sentido desde que lograste la libertad hace un año? Well, well when, uh, when the immigration finally released me in the border, I felt very happy because at least I was free. And, uh, and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was crossing the border and uh, I soon find out that uh, everything has changed completely. And I was kind of a lost. So the next thing I know, I'm going to the National Guard asking me questions. Uh, Where am I, where, where, where was I going? And what was my name and I, all of it. And uh, they told me that they needed to guard the deportees because they could be kidnapped at the border and ask for ransom to the families in the States. So uh, I had to run with the Mexican council in this car. We were running from the, from the, the kidnappers who tried to kidnap me because they they saw me with the Mexican council and they thought I was very important. So they tried to kidnap me. So, so the Mexican council finally got lost him and we went to his home and he asked me what I wanted to eat first because it was going to take me to Monterrey, Mexico and take a plane to Mexico City. So I told him that I wanted a, a cocktail, a shrimp cocktail. So he took me to a restaurant and he, he bought me a, a big cup of shrimps. And um, I was very, I was, I was very happy because I was dreaming about that for 40 years. <laughs> I used to, I used to uh, eat, eat shrimps in Mexico just about every week. So waiting for 40 years for another, for another cocktail was, was a long, long, long time. Anyway, they took me, they took me to the Monterrey airport and they kind of guide me all the way into the plane because I didn't know anything. Everything was new to me. So uh, we went in the plane And I arrived in Mexico City in about an hour and a half. And I was scared to death because it's been a long time since I've been in a plane. So when I when we arrived in Mexico City, I found I found Santiago there with a with a sign there saying Cesar Fierro, welcome to Mexico City. <laughs> and they took pictures of it. And uh Well, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been having a, I was having a very hard time adapting because I was afraid to come out of my room and I was afraid to be on the streets. 
I was afraid to be around people. So it was really difficult for me at the beginning. But thanks to Santiago and his family, I'm kind of uh, on the other side now. I, I, I can be on the streets alone. And I, I had a job, but I had to, I have to, I lost it because of the pandemic. And uh, right now I'm staying the same place. I've been for about a year and, and I'm, I've been hanging around with Santiago's sister and her dogs. I walk the dogs every, every day for three times a day. And I only see Santiago, his sister and his father. That's the only people I see uh, during the week. And I spend a lot of time lately watching Netflix because uh, I just learning to, to use it. I don't know how to use a computer. I don't know how to use a tablet. I don't know how to use the phone. It's, it's been very difficult for me to manage to, to handle the phone. And um, well, it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been hard, but, but despite everything, I'm very happy. I've been having a very good time with Santiago because he takes me places and, and he's a very nice guy. His family is very nice too. And uh, well, I've been, I've been having a good time with him. And, and I don't know, I don't know how, how to thank him because it's been, it, it's been great to me. And, and that, that's what's been happening with me. But uh, the bottom line is that, that I'm very happy. I'm very happy and I'm just waiting to see what I can do next. Well, Cesar, that sounds wonderful. It sounds really hopeful. And I'm sure that everyone listening to this is really happy to hear that. Um, I thought you were going to speak in Spanish and I was going to translate, but obviously you don't need me to help you with English, so you're doing great. Um, I will very briefly say, for those who don't speak English, um, que él dijo que había sentido una gran felicidad cuando por fin lo liberaron, que todavía tiene ciertos miedos de salir de su cuarto, pero que está mejor, no se está acomodando a todos los cambios que han ocurrido y que está muy, en este momento está muy cercano de Santiago, que lo está ayudando mucho, y naturalmente ha confrontado muchos cambios, no sabe usar la computadora todavía, ni los teléfonos, pero está trabajando en todo eso, and I'm sure that you're going to get really good at that, um, pretty good, uh, pretty soon. Okay, Santiago, this question is for you. What inspired you to make this powerful film? How did you learn about César, and what challenges did you encounter with presenting his story? ¿Qué te inspiró a hacer esta poderosa uh, do documental, ¿cómo te enteraste del caso de César y qué desafíos encontraste en el proceso de contar su historia? Well, first of all, thank you for, for organizing this event and, and, uh, and to, the, to the people who organized it. Uh, I started this, this project as a, as a school project when I was a student of the of the film department in Temple University in Philadelphia. And, uh, and that was around uh, about 10 years ago or maybe more. And around that time, the Avena case, which is a case in which Mexico uh, sued, the, sued the United States in the International Court of Justice, which maybe Sandra can explain later better than I. But um, it was, the case was getting to, the, to its final part and there was an important resolution in which uh, uh, basically all the efforts of Mexico were lost. Uh, so I was a student then at Temple University and uh, I was just following those news in the, when I was reading the newspaper. And then uh, there was a time for me to, to make a thesis proposal and I somehow came with the idea of, of making a documentary film about the Avena case. But then I realized that was uh, very ambitious and, uh, 
so I decided to focus in, in just one case because uh, otherwise it would have been very, very difficult for me to do it. Uh, so uh, after doing a little more of research, I, uh, I decided to, to, to try to approach Cesar and see if he would be interested in, in me making the film. And I talked to uh, first to Luis Lara of the Mexican consulate in Mexico, in Houston. And uh, he helped me to, to present the project to Cesar and, 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 and ask him if he was willing to, to see me for a first time in, in, uh, in Texas when he was still in prison. So I went to the prison, and, and, uh, but I did all the paperwork wrong. So I, I was not able to, <laughs> to enter the prison. And uh, by that time, uh, Cesar, it had been a, a while since he had received anyone from the media. So I just thought that he was not going to, you know, the first time he accepted to take a media interview again. And, and uh, the person who said that he would come, he doesn't show up because he doesn't even do the paperwork with the prison well. So I thought that was going to be the end of the project. And then one day I was at home and I received a letter from Cesar and he said that uh, if I could solve my problem and figure out how to get a permission from the a permission from the prison, then that he would be waiting for me there. And um, that was the beginning of the story. And uh, so that's how I met Cesar. And uh, the other question, I don't remember. What. I think it was uh, about the difficulties, right? Yes. So yeah. probably one of the, of the most difficult things in, in making the project is that access into the prison is, is uh, the permissions are for a very limited uh, amount of time. So that makes it uh, hard for, for, uh, for someone as a filmmaker to be able to, like, to try to go uh, deeper in, in an interview. And uh, I believe that has an effect that in many cases and in many, uh, like, the media sometimes approaches the, the death penalty in a very like criminal uh, point of view. So that is in my, in my view, like it's a narrative that favors death penalty instead of, instead of favoring, you know, the possibility of meeting the person who is uh, there. So um, I think probably one of the, of the huge uh, challenges challenge was uh, to, to overcome that and to be able to uh, continue going for the for the following interviews and, and, and that's it. <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question. Voy yeah, a decir yeah. en español lo más rápido que pueda. Eh, cuando yo eh, comencé esta película era un estudiante en la Universidad de Temple en el departamento de cine y eh, en ese momento estaba, era más o menos 2009 y se estaba tomando una decisión sobre el caso Avena, que es un caso en donde México eh, demandó a los Estados Unidos en la Corte Internacional de Justicia. Y yo seguía esa noticia porque me interesaba y en algún momento eh, hubo, hubo, tuve que tomar la decisión de hacer un proyecto de tesis. Así que decidí hacer, pero tenía la intención de hacer un documental sobre el caso Avena pero conforme fui avanzando en el proceso, me, me di cuenta que tenía que acotarlo y así fue que me decidí hacer el caso exclusivamente sobre César. Eh, después intenté visitar a César en la, en la prisión una primera vez, pero no logré entrar a la prisión porque había hecho mal los trámites de acceso y un día recibí una carta de César que me decía pues, que resolviera mi, mi, mi asunto para poder ingresar a la prisión y que él iba a estar ahí esperándome y así fue como comenzó el, el proyecto. Eh, sobre las dificultades, eh, creo que una de las dificultades más grandes es que la prisión eh, da un tiempo de, de entrevistas demasiado corto, son 45 minutos por entrevista y entre cada entrevista hay que esperar por lo menos tres meses y yo creo que eso hace difícil pues poder eh, tener la oportunidad de hacer un documental y tratar de llegar a las entrevistas a profundidad. Pues muchas gracias, Santiago. Um, gran documental y obviamente toda tu pasión se demuestra. Clearly, all of your passion shows in, in this film and it's, you know, it's, it's very moving. 
Um, at the end of the day, it's just an extremely moving film. Dick, this is for you. The documentary reveals that from arrest to trial to post-conviction proceedings, Fierro was a, a, a victim of a number of injustices. It's difficult to stress the significance of one over another, but which do you believe were the most damaging? El documental revela, let me give one second and then I'll say in Spanish. El documental revela que desde arresto hasta el juicio de los procedimientos posteriores de la condena, Fierro fue víctima de una serie de injusticias. Es difícil enfatizar la importancia de uno sobre otro, pero ¿cuáles crees que fueron los más dañinos? Which were the most damaging dead? You're muted. Uh, I think the most damaging was the way in which the El Paso police worked with the Juarez police to force Cesar to confess to the murder of Mr. Castañon. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, the, the, Juarez, the, the El Paso police did not have a viable suspect um, until this young man, Gerardo, Gerardo Elage, just showed up out of the blue with a story about the murder and that Cesar Fierro was the killer. Um, they did no investigation of Olage. They had no idea what his motivation was. They simply took that as a way of going after somebody and that somebody was Cesar. They learned that he was actually in the El Paso County Jail at that point on a just a minor charge. But they learned from that that he was from Juarez. They learned that his, his family lived there and they arranged with a corrupt police officer in Juarez to arrest his parents, bring them into the police station and threaten to torture them until Cesar confessed. And the corrupt El Paso police officer who had worked with and set up this whole arrangement um, got the Juarez officer on the phone with Cesar uh, and told Cesar that if you don't tell them what you, what you did, I'm going to torture your parents. Cesar knew that was not just an idle threat because he knew what those police officers in Juarez were capable of doing and had done for years. Uh, he knew that his parents could be hurt terribly. And so he confessed. That was the worst thing that happened. Um attempt to translate that very quickly. Um, and thank you, Dick. The most damaging, um, la injusticia más grande, dice el abogado Dick Burr, fue la manera que la policía del Paso funcionó con la policía de Juárez. Amenazaron, um, la familia amenazaron con torturar a la, a la familia, a los padres de, de César Fierro, y por lo tanto lograron que produjera la confesión, la cual fue en realidad basada en nada porque el, la persona que había um, atacado a, a, a César, en realidad la persona que había destacado a César, no era una persona que tenía nada más mínima credibilidad. Pero la policía del Paso, trabajando con una policía corrupta en Juárez, pudieron lograr la confesión de la cual lo llevó después a la cárcel. Thanks, Dick. Um, Sandra, tell us about uh, César's supposed confession and how you obtained evidence that it had been coerced following up on what Dick just said. Cuéntanos sobre la supuesta confesión de César y cómo obtuviste evidencia que había sido coaccionada. Uh, first of all, before I answer your question, I just have to say how happy it makes me to be on a panel with my former client, César Fierro. I just never would have imagined uh, that we would find ourselves here, um, you know, from the time that we were meeting in the prison. Uh, more than 20 years ago. Um, so I played a very small part in this case, but, I'm, um, but I remember very distinctly in 1993, I was working with another lawyer, Jean Terranova, who, had, who played a very important role in Cesar's case for many years. Uh, and Jean and I went to El Paso because we wanted to try to interview the detective who had, who had coerced Cesar's confession. Um, and this was psychological torture. This is, this is actual torture. This is recognized under international law as a form of torture. When you arrest someone's parents or loved ones and threaten to torture them in order to obtain a confession, that is psychological torture. 
Uh, and so we went to find Medrano. Uh, by this time, he was retired uh, from the police force. We went to his home. We didn't tell him we were coming. Uh, we just showed up. Uh, and he was, my memory is that he was, he was looking pretty bad. Um, this is a person who, um, Medrano was not a good person. He um, was somebody who was a corrupt cop, um, but he agreed to speak to us. We came into his house um, and he started to talk. And like many people who lie for a living, he forgot what lies he had told at the time of Cesar's trial. At the time of Cesar's trial, he denied everything. He said, I was never in touch with Comandante Palacios, who was the cop in Ciudad Juarez. I don't know what Cesar Fierro was talking about. He gave this confession voluntarily. Um, I never pressured him. I don't know what you're talking about with threatening his parents. You know, I had nothing to do with that. But when we spoke to him, um, he said that he was in touch with Palacios. And we got him to write an affidavit and sign an affidavit where he agreed that he was in touch with Palacios. Uh, and this was, Dick, am I right about that? Did we get the affidavit? My memory is that that's what happened. It's a long time ago. Um, and that's when we knew. It was the first time that we had external confirmation of what Cesar had been saying for so many years. Um, and Cesar's parents also had been saying for so many years. Um, so that was, I think, in my view, a turning point uh, in the case. Voy a intentar de traducirlo en español. Lo que quería decir antes que nada es un enorme honor compartir este foro con César Fierro, que fue mi cliente hace casi 30 años. Um, y nunca había imaginado que podría estar aquí con César. Uh, es, me, me hace muy, muy feliz estar aquí con, con él. Um, en 1993, y yo, eh, una otra abogada que, tomó, que tuvo un papel muy importante en el, en el caso de César, eh, fuimos al paso para intentar de entrevistar a Detective Medrano, que fue el detective de El Paso que complotó con eh, Comandante Palacios, el detective en Ciudad Juárez que había secuestrado los, uh, los um, papás de César y que les había amenazado con la tortura, con la chicharra. Eh, nosotros fuimos a entrevistar a Medrano para ver si Medrano podía decirnos o admitir que había eh, eh, de hecho eh, eh, coludido o Complotó, complotado con la policía de, de El Juárez para um, forzar la confesión de César. Y cuando llegamos, el detective Medrano eh, se acordó a hablar con nosotros y durante la conversación, como, morta, mo, como muchas personas que, que mientan, como los mentirosos en todas partes, él había olvidado las mentiras que había dicho durante el proceso de César. Y entonces cuando, nos, cuando nosotros hablamos con él, nos dijo que sí había tenido contacto con la policía de Ciudad Juárez. Y eso había siempre negado en el proceso de César. Y fue la primera vez que hemos tenido una prueba eh, externa, es, es decir, una prueba aparte de lo que César siempre ha dicho, que la policía lo había eh, sometido a la, a la tortura psicológica diciendo que sus papás han sido, eh, han estado secuestrados en, en Juárez y que 
la policía de Juárez, um, uh, that they were going to torture him, uh, que le iban a tortur torturar. Um, entonces fue un momento clave en, en la historia del, del caso de, de César. Gracias, Sandra. It's, it, it's really wonderful to hear the story from all the different angles and the parts that each one of you has played. Cesar, this is for you. You endured 40 years on death row. As you express in the film, you lost everything. Your family, Leticia, your wife, Cindy, your daughter, and of course, 40 years of your life. Where did you find hope to continue to fight for your freedom? Well, that was very, that's, that's very simple. Uh, I knew I didn't do anything. So I, I hope sooner or later, I was gonna come out. And uh, it was very difficult to be there because um, I had a lot of problems. And the only, the only thing that I, that I used to do to console myself was to sing Mexican songs and, and hope they could get me out of there sooner or later, which it is. But, uh, but it, it, was very, it was very difficult for me. But I always, I always hope, I, I had hoped that I was gonna make it out sooner or later, one day I was gonna come out. And that's why I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't lose hope at all. Dick knows it. I always, I always uh, had, had a lot of faith in Dick. And even when he, he was not very confident about the case, I always tell him that I, I was going to make it. And yeah, Dick was very helpful because he was, he used to visit me and tell me things going fine and everything. And well, this is how, this how I did it. Let me ask it in, in Spanish and then I'll translate your answer. Um, yo le pregunté a César, um, había, ha estado 40 años en el corredor de la muerte, ¿dónde encontró la esperanza? Porque lo perdió todo, su familia, su esposa y 40 años de su vida. Y él responde que él sabía que era, que era inocente y que en algún momento iba a lograr la libertad. Puso mucha fe sobre su abogado Dick Burr y también la esperanza de que en algún momento se le iba a abrir la puerta y poder lograr su, su libertad. Y cuenta también que cantaba canciones mexicanas para, para pasar el tiempo. Although that's a lot of, that's a long time, César, to be singing Mexican songs while <laughs> doing, yeah, while doing all that. So yeah, it's, it's unimaginable for most of us. Um, Santiago, it was interesting that you chose to spend some spend time talking to the victim's wife, Mrs. Castañón, right at the beginning of the, that's how your document, um, um, the document begins, sorry, documental. So what was the objective of, um, what were you seeking in doing that? Were you surprised that she did not seek this, that, that she not support the death penalty? Because that was surprising to me when I watched the film. In the documental, dedicaste tiempo a la viuda de Castañón, cuál fue tu objetivo, y te sorprendió que ella no estaba uh, well, uh, I think that uh, as a filmmaker, you have to an obligation to try to be uh, balanced in, in the way you approach a story like this. And uh, even though you always have to take a stand and position yourself and, you know, it's like complete objectivity is probably impossible. But uh, I think that you, you need to try to, to see both sides. And, and that's why at the beginning, I, I, I thought it was good to you know, contact the police. And that's why I contacted one of the policemen, who, this policeman Palacios, and also try to contact the victim's family. And uh, what I found really interesting is that she was completely opposed uh, to, to the death penalty in the case of Cesar. And that was uh, because she didn't believe he was guilty. She didn't believe the case was handled correctly. And also because she was a, a Catholic person and, and uh, 
uh, death penalty is against Catholicism. And I think this is a story that repeats uh, for, for what I've learned in, about death penalty in, in the US from, from, from Sandra and from Vic. I think this is a story that repeats constantly. And uh, in many cases, uh, the victim's uh, family, they don't want the, the execution of the people. So if there is, if you know, usually the idea that the, the whole point of the death penalty has to do with justice for the victim, but you know, that justice for them often doesn't work and is not the right form of justice. So uh, when I decided to put uh, her testimony in the film was to, to just try to put that on the table that uh, uh, this is, if it's, it's not the correct form of justice, I would say. Uh, now I'm gonna try to say it in Spanish. Eh, yo creo que uno como cineasta tiene que tener eh, la responsabilidad de tratar de tener un punto de vista balanceado en una historia, sobre todo en una historia como esta. Y en ese sentido, eh, a pesar de que creo que la objetividad completa como documentalista es muy difícil eh, o casi imposible de lograr porque uno siempre tiene una posición desde donde edita, desde donde dirige, eh, creo que existe la responsabilidad de tratar de ver las dos partes y por eso... Eh, quise entrevistar a la policía y quise entrevistar a la, a la señora Castañón, Josie García. Ella se oponía completamente a la pena de muerte en el caso de César. Se oponía porque eh, creía que César era inocente, porque creía que el caso se había manejado muy mal desde el punto de vista legal y porque era católica. Y para las personas católicas eh, la pena de muerte es, es una cosa que no es, no es correcta. Eh, además de eso... Me parece importante que al ella oponerse a esta forma, eh, que creo que es una historia que se repite frecuentemente, que los familiares de la víctima no encuentran en la pena de muerte justicia. Muchas veces encuentran más sufrimiento y más revictimización en, en un tipo de justicia así. Entonces a mí me pareció importante eh, poner eso en la película porque creo que es una forma de... de pues de cuestionar si, si la pena de muerte es una forma correcta de hacer justicia. Thank you, Santiago. Um, Dick, release from death row is a rare occurrence. In a few words, can you explain how Fierro came to be released after serving 40 years? La liberación del corredor de la muerte es un hecho bastante raro. En pocas palabras, puedes explicar cómo llegó a ser liberado Fierro después de cumplir 40 años. Um, he came to be released because finally, in 2019, the Court of Criminal Appeals of Texas applied a change in law to him that required that he have a new sentencing trial. At the same time, we had amassed huge amounts of evidence that he was innocent, more so than ever been presented before. The court ignored that um, and said, we'll give him a new sentencing trial. During that time, the last few years, we had persuaded the district attorney in El Paso to agree to a life sentence uh, if uh, uh, Cesar got a new trial uh, or to agree to a, a lesser sentence if he got a whole new trial. Uh, in December of 2019, this Court of Criminal Appeals ordered a new sentencing trial. By the end of January of 2020, he was sent, Cesar was sentenced to life with the agreement of the El Paso district attorney. He then went to a different prison. And uh, we were, the, you know, he had a pretty high powered legal team, not just, <laughs> I was the lowest wattage bulb on that team, but Sandra had gotten a wonderful New York law firm involved. And we were beginning to put together a very, you know, very powerful brief to file with the partner parole board about getting him parole. In the meantime, Cesar was interviewed by one of the parole board members that we didn't even know about was going to happen. And he won that parole board member over. And within a week or two, the whole poor parole board voted to parole him, despite his high powered legal team. <laughs> um, Cesar did it himself. And the, the, the way he did it was the way he survived death row. He went through turmoil and turmoil and suffering like, like you can't even imagine. 
and he came out on the other end. He kept singing. He kept his spirits up. He survived how many execution dates, Cesar? 10 or 12? Yes, like 10 or 12. Um, and he kept going. He kept singing. And by the time he could talk to somebody who had the power to let him go, that person was won over. Cesar did that himself. Um, and within, that was in early March, I think, of 2020. Uh, he was paroled by, the, towards the end of April, actually released from uh, prison towards the end of April. He was taken into custody by immigration authorities because he had to be deported. And unlike, unlike, unlike most immigration lawyers, we were advocating to get him deported quickly because he <laughs> wanted to get back home. And uh, it still took about three weeks for that to happen, but he did get deported and the wonderful help of the Mexican consulate in coordinating his uh, you know, transfer at the border, they picked him up and protected him from kidnappers. And I hadn't heard about the wild ride <laughs> away from the kidnappers before today, but uh, then he, he made his way to Santiago who, find, you know, who opened, welcomed him with open arms. And um, Cesar is very modest about how he's doing. I, I understand he's now actually teaching uh, people in Mexico to look, to speak English. So he's 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 not just staying in his apartment. He's out doing good for people. <laughs> Dick, the partly the reason he was able to get parole was because at the time he was sentenced, though there was life with parole. Right. That, that's right. He he was eligible for parole. I think after twenty years, and so. By the time he got off of death row, he had served 40 years in prison and was, you know, 20 years overdue for eligibility for parole. That didn't necessarily mean he'd get paroled. Other people who had been on death row a long time and got, you know, life sentences have not been paroled. So it, it still is, I think, I think the magical thing that happened was Cesar himself. Uh, you know, he was his own best advocate when it mattered the most. Um, it probably didn't hurt that the pandemic was setting in and they wanted to get rid of older prisoners who were more vulnerable. That probably helped some too. Um, but he did it. He did it because of who he is. El abogado Dick Bird le da mucho um, a lo que César hizo para poder salir de la cárcel. Um, en algún momento, en el 2000, 2019, la Corte decidió darle un nuevo juicio de sentencia, pero en realidad el abogado explica que César convenció a uno de los miembros de la Junta de Parole um, a que le dieran en realidad una liberación um, temprana, ¿no? Y que por lo tanto, y él le da mucho crédito a César por todo lo que él hizo, por su esperanza, por mantenerse siempre positivo y por siempre creer que iba a ser liberado. Um, Sandra, how common is it for individuals facing capital charges to falsely confess? Antes de contestar esa pregunta, este, quería destacar que César uh, tenía más de 10 fechas de ejecución. Entonces, este, el estado de Texas casi, casi lo ejecutaron, casi lo ejecutó. Entonces, es, 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 es un punto muy, muy importante porque César sufrió la tortura. Es, es también una forma de tortura que sufrió cuando estaba en el corredor de la muerte en Texas. Sorry, I just wanted to, to emphasize the, the 10 execution dates and how that's a form of, of torture as well. Um, so, how common is it for people to falsely confess? That is the question. Yes, particularly um, capital cases. So it is, it happens. It happens more often than we think. Um, many people say, why would anyone confess to a crime they didn't commit? But what they don't understand is the pressure that police can bring to bear on someone who is in detention, the fear that people have um, and their vulnerability. So Cesar, at the time of his arrest, did not uh, speak English. 
Um, he is somebody who uh, came to, um, to El Paso, but, uh, and even though these are, the border area is one where there is also English and Spanish spoken, he was in an English speaking legal system, which already made him more vulnerable. Um, and he is being interrogated by a police officer who is applying tactics of psychological torture. Even without psychological torture though, many people falsely confess. Um, and they do it because it is such an intimidating environment and because police are trained to elicit confessions. Um, and this, this was especially true in that era. So, um, you know, with that, in that era, for example, uh, interrogations were not tape recorded. They were not audio videotaped or audio taped. Um, now, in many jurisdictions, they are being videotaped. Um, there were so few constraints on the police that they could apply a lot of different methods um, to, to elicit confessions from people. Um, and the, the impetus really is to, um, you know, their, their goal is to get a confession, right? Um, and oftentimes there are, clearly there are good police officers who believe in, you know, just finding out the truth and making sure that the right person is, um, is prosecuted for uh, serious crimes. But there are also police officers like Detective Medrano and like Comandante Palacios. Their only concern was really getting some, like getting somebody for this crime and saying that they closed the case. Uh, and that person that they chose was Cesar. Entonces, este voy a intentar. Uh, disculpe, mi español no es perfecto, pero voy a intentar. Es lo que decía es que um, es más común que la mayoría de la gente piensa que las personas confesan a los crímenes, a los delitos que no cometieron. Es mucho más común porque la policía es experimentada en aplicar la coerción y en el caso de César fue más que por co coerción, fue la tortura psicológica. En, en esa posición, cuando una persona es detenida, como en el caso de César, César eh, fue un migrante mexicano, no habló inglés por nada eh, en, en el momento en que fue arrestado. Y entonces fue ya eh, muy vulnerable a la coerción y a la presión de la policía. Y muchas personas por el temor, por eh, la, eh, la presión eh, que sientan, um, por su vulnerab vulnerabilidad, um, es que confesan aunque sean inocentes. En el caso de César, este fue mucho más grave porque es, fue una, un caso de tortura en, pues todo, no, todos nosotros, yo creo, eh, confesaríamos. Si la policía nos dijo que iban a torturar a los papás si no confesamos, pues yo confesaría pues inmediatamente. Entonces, es, es, en el caso de César, fue, fue algo que, que todos podemos entender. Pero aún en otros casos, hay personas que confesan a los delitos que no cometan, que no han cometido, por la presión que aplica la policía. Thank you, Sandra. Um, César. Both Sandra and Dig Burr have spoken about the, the number of executions that were scheduled in your case. And both of them have alluded to the psychological torture. Sandra has spoken about that, and Dig Burr, of course, about the toll that it takes. In the film, you were very candid about having to tell your mother every time that you were scheduled for an execution because you needed for her to plan and whatever she needed to do. And I I'm sure that everyone found that to be a very moving moment in the film. 
So I can only assume that the threat of execution of these dates looming must have taken a great toll. Can you talk about that? No le entendí, señor. Se preguntó que cuando te dieron las distintas fechas de ejecución, mm. eh, que como, que si puedes hablar un poco de eso, como, como tenías que decirle a tu mamá y eso. No, ya sabía, se me olvidó. Mm. Well, it was very hard for me uh, to speak to my mother and tell her that I had an execution date because uh, she was ill and she cries a lot. She used to cry a lot and I didn't have the words to console her because I was going to get executed, maybe or maybe not, but uh, I had to get it, get her ready for whatever happened, but it, it was very difficult because um, I didn't hear the words. And I, I was talking to her and she was crying and, and I was, I feel like I was useless because I couldn't do nothing to, to console her, but uh, but you know the the visit will end, and she will go away crying, and I will stay all night without sleep, thinking about her, and wondering what what was going to happen to her, because uh, I was very close to my mom, and and it was very difficult for me to to tell her about the execution dates, whether they happen or not. And besides what you felt about your mom and the difficulty of telling your mom, what was your own state of mind? How did you handle all of these different executions? Um, ¿Cómo pudiste lidiar con todas estas fechas de ejecución que te daban? Además de lo que sentías por tu mamá, la pena, la, la, la inhabilidad de consolar a tu madre. ¿Cómo te sentías? ¿Cómo eres tu estado mental? ¿Cómo era el tuyo? Bueno... Uh, well, you're probably not going to believe this, but I was very tranquil. I didn't, I, wa I wasn't worried about, about the execution or anything like that, despite the fact that one time I was four hours away from execution. But uh, I was, like I said before, I was confident. I had hope that I was going to make it one day. So I didn't really was I wasn't really afraid of the, of the execution, and I wasn't worried about the execution at all. What I was worried about was my mother, because she was the one that was getting executed, in so many words. Le pregunté a César um, la dificultad que tiene que haber sentido cuando tenía que decirle a su madre que tenía una fecha de ejecución pendiente y él dice que fue una época muy mala cada vez que tenía que hablar con su madre porque se sentía inútil y sabía que su madre se quedaba desconsolada y que él no sabía cómo consolarla en un momento tan difícil. Pero como ustedes oyeron, él personalmente tenía tranquilidad sobre eso y paz pensando siempre que iba a ser liberado. That's pretty amazing, um, César. Um, I want to ask Santiago, we're getting close to the end, and I know we want to hear maybe a little bit more before we leave, but your interview with Jorge Palacios, both Sandra and Dick Burr have spoken about Jorge Palacios. This is the head of the Secret Service in Juarez. He was very telling the way he behaved, the way he answered the questions. What did you personally take away from his interview and the answers? In en the entrevista de Jorge Palacios, el jefe de servicio de, Juar de Secreto de Juarez, fue muy reveladora. ¿Qué sacaste personalmente tú de esa entrevista y las respuestas que te dio? Well, I believe that Mr. Palacios was a kind of, of a Mexican a macho cop who thought that, you know, he could uh, brag about his uh, his, uh, I don't know how to put it, 
his achievements as a policeman. And I think at the beginning he started to do that. And then as the as the interview was going on, you know, you can you can tell what kind of cop he was. Uh, he was not a cop who who would um, care about other things, but uh, just about obtaining what what they want. And, and a cop who 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 went to investigate already with a mindset about uh, you know that not of investigating, but just to you know uh, how to frame the person, how to you know. Uh, Get the necessary things to 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 find him guilty, and 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 I think you can tell that from the way from the way he speaks, from the way he 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 says that he had to use some tricks as a policeman to make people you know talk. He didn't say what kind of tricks, but you know you could you can imagine what he's talking about, and uh, I think. Even if he, during the interview he never acknowledged that uh, he he arrested Cesar's mother, I think at least you can tell what kind of cop he was, and uh, that's why we use that that uh, that interview in the film. Creo que creo que el comandante Palacios era un policía que presumía de sus hazañas como policía de una manera pues como lo hacían los policías antes, ¿no? Eh, y que llegó a investigar el caso eh, con la intención de encontrar un culpable, no con la intención de investigar. Creo que ese sigue siendo un problema en la policía en México, eh, que incluso en casos más recientes se, se, sigue, se sigue viendo, ¿no? La policía no investiga, la policía hace lo que sea para encontrar un culpable y sacarse el caso de encima. Eh, y creo que durante la entrevista con el comandante Palacios uno puede darse cuenta eh, el tipo de policía que era. Exacto. Bastante desperuzante esa ese, ese entrevista. Thank you. Um, Sandra, we only have a few minutes left and I want you and Dick Bird to just say a few final words um, before we conclude and then I'm going to ask Cesar just one last question at the end. But what would you like to say to Cesar, or what would you like to express about the, the case and the fact that he's here with us now? Do you want me to answer first or Dick? Yeah, please, Sandra. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what I want to say is, you know, I think a lot of times when we hear about cases like Cesar's, we think, oh, this is a, a triumph, right? This is a wonderful story because Cesar is free. And we are all so happy that Cesar is free, but I'm still so angry at what happened to Cesar. And I'm so angry that he was released um, and just driven to the border and pushed back into Mexico. Well, thank God he's in Mexico again. But at the same time, he was given nothing by the state to compensate him for all those years of torture that they subjected him to. Um, 40 years of his life was stolen from him, um, and he lost his mother while he was in prison. He lost his brother while he was in prison. Um, Cesar lost so much, and he is a remarkable human who is very resilient, but um, it is a crime that, that he was released without any means of support provided by the state um, for what they did to him. So I, um, I really hope that people can uh, contribute to the GoFundMe site that was set up for Cesar uh, because he needs our support. Um, and we need to form a community around Cesar and others like him uh, to support him because he deserves it. Um, and the state clearly is not gonna do it. Um, entonces en español lo que quiere, quería decir es que uh, aunque esté muy, muy feliz, que César esté eh, libero, que esté contento, es una persona increíble. Um, estoy todavía muy, um, um, how do I say, Ten, tengo mucha rabia por lo que el estado de Texas hizo uh, uh, a César, lo que la tortura 
que, uh, que, que se hace, ¿Qué pasó? Uh -huh. lo duro que la tortura que pasó sí este todo el sufri, sufrimiento que tuvo César durante estos 40, 40 años eh, que el estado de Texas eh, lo robó eh, entonces es que este, esta historia no es una historia eh, de un, un rieto, no un rieto, una, un éxito. No es un éxito, es una tragedia. Y es importante que nosotros apoyemos, apoyemos a César, eh, que nosotros formamos una comunidad, eh, que lo apoyamos porque el estado de Texas lo lo dejo en libertad, pero sin ninguna manera de sostenerlo. De sosten este, él no tiene ninguna manera de sostenerse y, um, y necesita nuestra ayuda. I'm sorry, that was terrible Spanish. No, it's fine. The point, the point is well taken. Everybody understood everything you said. Thank you so much, Sandra. Dick, um, just a few seconds left. Uh, what would you like to tell Cesar? What would you like the audience to know? Your microphone. I agree with all the sentiments and the thoughts that Sandra just expressed. Uh, my heart is broken uh, for the 40 years taken from Cesar and for all of the sort that, you know, he suffered torture for much of that 40 years too. Um, it is what happened to him could happen to anybody. There was no investigation in this case. A young man who was mentally ill named Olake came to the police and fingered Cesar, maybe because he was guilty, maybe because he knew somebody who was and he wanted to protect them, but he fingered Cesar. And all the, the police did after that was to find a way to confirm that. There was no investigation. There was just a trap. Um, and the fact that that happened and it took 40 years for there to be no justice, <laughs> only, this, only the sparing of his life, which is a wonderful thing. This is a life you can tell that's worth sparing. And it's a life that can do much good left with whatever time Cesar has. But it is, it is so difficult, even with that corrupt process, to get it undone. Um, And it does take a whole community now to say no to that. And you say no by helping Cesar. Thank you, Dick. Um, Cesar, we conclude the evening with you. What would you like to, for the audience to know? What can we do to help? Obviously, we've heard from your lawyers and their heartfelt sentiments. But tell us in your own words, what would you like us to know? What can we do to help? Well, um, I don't really, I don't really know know what to say, but uh, whatever you can do for me is fine. That's all I can say. And I want to thank Rachel and Sandra and Santiago and you for having me here. And everybody, hello. <laughs> That's very, very sweet. Thank you. Um, Cesar, as we have heard, maintains his innocence. He has not been officially exonerated and therefore is unable to receive compensation from the state of Texas for his 40 years of wrongful incarceration. If you have the means to do so, please consider donating mm -hmm. to the GoFundMe mm -hmm. campaign the supporters have created for him, which will provide him with funds during this ongoing transition to freedom. The link, I believe, has been put in the chat and will be available to you. Thank you to all of you who have donated already. Um, and with that, we conclude our evening. Sandra and Dick, um, your heartfelt sentiments um, will stay with me clearly. Your passion is um, unparalleled. Um, Cesar, we are grateful to you that you're with us um, and that everyone throughout um, has been able to, to hear your voice and, and hear from your lawyers. Santiago, thank you for making this wonderful documentary and 
and, and in fact, memorializing his life and everything that has gone through. To all of you, thank you. Thank you to our wonderful panel. Um, thank you for your continued support and thank you to all the sponsors for this evening. And with that, we say good night. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Yes, yes, thank you. Bye-bye.